Good evening once again, and a special welcome if you missed us last month when those dramatic news events caused us to be moved to BBC Two. It was a shift that had a remarkable consequence, more of which in just a moment. Tonight, we hope to find everyone who was in a Cardiff nightclub, Jackson's, on the Friday before Christmas. Somebody there might have seen the man who murdered a young woman. Police need more witnesses to a car chase near Oxford, where more than a dozen local people foiled a robbery and chased two gunmen out of town. And perhaps you can help discover who killed a London businessman as he sat working late one evening at his office. Before that, let me tell you about that extraordinary result from last month's programme. Extraordinary because, indirectly, the Allies' first airstrike on Iraq may have helped to solve a murder in South London. An ex-headmaster had been strangled at his home in Plumstead and two televisions had gone missing from the house. One of you watched the programme on a second-hand TV she'd bought not long ago, but she didn't manage to write down the serial numbers we gave out to compare them with her own. Now, this is where events in the Gulf come in. Because of the outbreak of war, Crime Watch had been rescheduled, rather to the irritation of her next-door neighbour, who had set her video recorder to tape the 40 Minutes documentary on BBC Two. When she rewound the tape and found that we were on it, frankly, she was rather disappointed. But her friend from next door was delighted. She checked the serial numbers and found they tallied. As a result, two young men have been arrested and they've been charged with murder. There's also been an arrest in connection with a reconstruction we showed in December. After an armed raid on a security van in Liverpool, a police constable test riding a new patrol bike was threatened with a sawn-off shotgun. One viewer thought the video fit we showed was so like a man she knew it might have been a photograph. Eventually, a friend of a friend of hers rang the police. One man has now been charged in connection with the raid and another is actively being sought. Tonight's first reconstruction is of a crime that had so many witnesses you might think it's a wonder the police need any more. It's an armed raid on a security van near Oxford. A robbery that had to be abandoned because so many drivers and people from a nearby builders merchants decided to intervene. Now we've changed some minor details for security reasons and we filmed when it was snowing, which it wasn't when the robbery took place. The day is exactly one week before Christmas, Tuesday the 18th of December, and it's half past two outside the Unipart factory in Garsington Road in Cowley. That guy over there, Mick, looks so he's having a pee. Very clever if he is, no hands. Notice the light-coloured car at the front, though it might not have been a Volvo. Nick! Nick! Quick! Somebody's just been shot! Been oh, my God! The driver of this pursuing car is an ex-police officer. John's Brian. John Armblag, Unipark, Garsington Road. 
I'm in pursuit of a Vauxhall dark blue G818 VPD. Two targets, one of them armed. Handgun, pistol. I repeat, a dark blue Vauxhall. I think they may be a London team because of the handgun situation. One of the guards either seriously or fatally shot. They're going out of a whack. 80, 90 through Garsington. I'm going to have difficulty at the top here, I think. John, I've lost them. They've obviously not come up onto this road. I'm turning back. Without a doubt, they've gone straight across the crossroads towards Berensfield. At 20 to 3, Linda Madel was driving up Tootbalden Road. Immediately I saw him, I thought, there's something very suspicious going on. And he was sort of in a panicky state. He looked very pale. And I just thought he was up to no good. There was another witness with his dog in an adjoining field. A little later, further down the lane, a cyclist saw a jogger. And just after three o'clock, the police got to the lay-by where the robbers had been parked. They could hardly miss the evidence. Bags. Rather for 9-1. Piece of number plate up in the nine head. 9-1, go ahead. Yeah, can you arrange the scenes of crime mobile for me, please? It took Borden Road. Near side, we found some number plate helmets and that in a ditch. Proceed to it. Yes, 9-1 on the scene. Bravo for help. Have a look in the field just to make sure. And at about the same time, two miles further up the main road that runs through Newnham Courtney, a quality inspector road testing a new car had stopped to check the vehicle. We have a replica of that gun here. Dave Buckingham, first of all, what about the security guard who was apparently shot? shot? What sort of condition is he in? He's fine, Nick. Had a bruised and swollen cheek, but he was lucky that a blank was fired, otherwise he could have been very seriously injured or even killed. Now, in fact, the gun that was used that fired blanks isn't a real one, it's, it's a replica, a very popular make of replica. It's a Brunei 8mm uh, made in Italy, and it's a replica Beretta. We would like to hear from anybody who may have had one stolen or knows of anybody who purchased one recently and is now no longer in possession of it since the 18th of December. Now, the blanks that were in this may hold the key because uh, before the robbery, the night before, in fact, at 6.15, a man walked into the Dunmore Shooting Centre on the Wooden Road in Abingdon, which is about five miles from Cowley. I'm sorry, sir, we're closed. You don't have to sell me anything. Look, do you have any of these? Yes, eight millimeter blanks. I sell them, but not this particular type. Do you want gunners for? Uh, no, I don't. But it's a good one. Let's have a look at the magazine. No, I can't tell, I'm afraid. If I say the wrong blanks, you could hurt yourself or the gun. Well, it's only in the car. I can go and get it if you like. Well, I'm closed now, but I open at nine in the morning. If you bring it back, then I'll see what I can do. Yeah. OK? OK. OK. Bye-bye. Now, you think this man just might be the man in the robbery who drove the getaway car? He's very similar to the uh, video fit produced by the witness at Toot Borden, who saw the man next to the blue Vauxhall. 
at Abingdon, he was uh, wearing a, a light beige shirt and dark trousers. At Toot Balden by the Vauxhall, he was wearing a denim jacket and dark trousers. He's a pretty big guy, about six foot tall, and uh, so is the, the second man, the gunman. The gunman, also about six foot, wears size 11, si size 11 shoes, you know that, and sort of receding dark hair. What about the woman in the car, in that light-coloured car that drove in front? Ostensibly, she was turning round in the road. Of course, she could have been there simply to set up the robbery. Yes. We would like her to come forward if she, if she is an innocent party just turning round in the road. Or we would like to hear from somebody who knows a woman driving a similar car uh, who is an associate of the two offenders. Now, the clothing that was dumped was quite distinctive. We've got uh, a, a picture of the blue tracksuit, which has a star emblem with an eight on it, as you can see, and the trousers say O'Neill. And found with the clothes was this receipt. Tell us about it. Yes, the receipt is from Roach's Stores in Cork, Southern Ireland. The amounts on the receipt are actually amounts for the tracksuit top and bottom. And we would like to know if anybody who's been across to Ireland, maybe on holiday, or just visited and purchased such items recently. They were purchased about six days before the robbery on the 12th of December. So there may well be an Irish connection somehow to this. The, the dark blue Vauxhall Cavalier, Cavalier that the robbers used to escape in has never been found, has it? No, it has a, a broken rear passenger window. We would like to hear from anybody who knows such a vehicle. They may have had it stolen, maybe a hire vehicle, or it could be the offender's own vehicle. Or maybe you repaired that sort of damage of vehicle. This is the plate that was made up, or one of them. If you made up that plate too, do please let us know, G818VPD. Indeed, if you can help us in any way, do please call. There's the number, 081-811-8181. 081 The detectives are waiting now, or indeed you can speak to a BBC researcher if you prefer. Alternatively, you can call Cowley Police Station, that's 0865 266 331. 0865, the code for Oxford, 266 331. Well, more news now from last month's Crime Watch. Despite the fact that the murder of Barbara Mayo took place 20 years ago, we had about 200 calls as a result of our reconstruction. Some of those were from people who'd harboured suspicions for many years, but thought the inquiry had long since been abandoned. Several calls were from women admitting that the alibis they'd given for boyfriends at the time had been false. And a few women said they remembered seeing a handbag like Barbara's missing one in the back of an ex-boyfriend or husband's car. Altogether, there are at least 20 promising new lines of investigation. There's been less to go on in the parallel inquiry into the murder of Jackie Ansel Lamb, also in 1970. But there have been some new leads which police are working on now and will keep you informed. And as a result of photo call in December, a man had hired quite a lot of uh, video equipment, if you remember, and each time, as part of the rental agreement, he had a Polaroid picture taken of himself. Now, a viewer recognised the picture when we showed it, rang us with a name, and the police went round to check it. A man has now been charged with deception and handling stolen goods. Well, now to this month's photo call. If you recognise anyone, we need to hear from you. Here with the details are Superintendent David Hatcher and Detective Constable Jackie Hames. Colleagues investigating a rape in Bradford would like to speak to this man, Fazard Baboud. He was last seen in March last year in Brighton. He's 37 and 5 foot 9 inches tall with neatly cut dark brown hair. He's usually smartly dressed. He has family connections in Harrogate, North Yorkshire, so if you've seen him there or have had any dealings with him, please call us now. Officers in Merseyside believe this man is responsible for 13 armed robberies in the Liverpool area. He often tries to cover his face, but here he is on December the 6th last year, unmasked and brandishing a gun. He's frightened many shopkeepers and must be found before that gun goes off. So if you recognise him, please give us a call. Warwickshire Police have asked for your help to find William James Dolman. He may have information about the loss of £4,000 worth of property from a house in Rugby. Last year, Mr Dolman travelled the country and is known to have visited Plymouth, Bolton and Gloucester. He often goes to singles clubs where he befriends middle-aged women, but he moves on from each place after a month or so, often with money they've lent him. He's 47, 5 foot 7, well built with a slightly pockmarked face. He has a scar around his right eye and may have a very faint tattoo of the name Jerry on one of his hands. Billy Dolman may be driving a blue and white Bedford van, registration GYH342W. 
He usually stays in bread and breakfast or ben rented bedsits. If you know where he is, please ring us now. And finally, colleagues here in London are looking for this man who's carried out over 120 frauds. This photograph was taken at a bank in Hampstead back in June 1988. Then in June last year, he became nervous while waiting for a cashier to return and walked out just as the security camera was activated. These shots were taken as he was leaving empty-handed from another London bank last October. He's mainly been seen around North London, but has been to the South End area of Essex. He's about 25, 5 feet 10 tall, medium build and usually smartly dressed. So if you think you recognise him or any of our other photo call faces, call us now. And here's the number, 081 811 8181. 081 811 8181. Our next reconstruction tonight is a burglary which turned into murder. 39-year-old Derek Johnson was a happily married family man, devoted to his wife and 12-year-old son, and devoted to, to the thriving import and export business he'd built up with a partner over the past 17 years. On the evening of Tuesday the 6th of November, just after returning from a week's holiday in Spain with his family, Derek Johnson was found dead in his office in East London. Police have helped us make the film you're about to see, piecing together what is known of the last day of Derek's life. The reconstruction takes place at Derek's office in Canning Town in East London. This is Canning Town flyover. Just nearby on Lanrick Road is Leapfield Maritime Limited, where Derek Johnson worked as financial director. Derek was quite a workaholic and often stayed late at the office. Hello? Hello, Mark. It's Dad. How are you? Oh, I'm OK. But it's due, Dad, tonight. But whenever he did work late, he would always ring home to say goodnight to his young son. No, I suppose not, Dad. OK, then. Look, uh, I've got to go now. I'm working late tonight, so I'll see you tomorrow, OK? OK, Dad. See ya. Yeah, OK. No, no. About three weeks before Derek's death, one night in mid-October, there'd been an odd incident. Who are you? What are you doing here? I've come to pick up the cleaners. Well, you're here. Go on, get out. After that, Derek had arranged for all the locks of the office block to be changed. It's now Tuesday, the 6th of November, the day Derek died. It was a hectic day with a backlog of work to catch up on after his holiday. As soon as I can, okay? Fine. Hello. Hello, love. How are you? Yeah, I'm not to my eyes. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to stay late tonight. Never mind, I thought you probably would. But don't forget to ring Mark later to say goodnight. When do I ever forget him? Eh? As usual, the cleaners arrived at about half past five. Oh, by the way, uh, Steve popped in today. The uh, name and address of his new restaurant. Oh, great, that's the one he was telling us about. Yeah. Ah, let's get booked in. A colleague, Christian Muto, popped in to say goodnight as he passed Derek's office. I left the office at a couple of minutes past six at the absolute latest and noticed a couple of boys standing over the road just by world-class imports. Um, as I got across the road, looked out of the corner of my eye, they'd turned and were starting to follow. When I got up to the corner of Landrick Road, again looked back, they were following me. When I walked on down to the next kink, I looked back, they'd vanished. Whether they'd gone up onto the flyover, or whether they'd gone back to world-class imports, which was still open, uh, or whether they just walked back to the flats or onto the industrial estate, I don't know. All right. Are you in tomorrow? Yeah, I'll see you in the morning. Yeah, all right. Okay. Hi, Brian. Hi, Dan. All right. Hi, Dan. Hi, Dan. Hi, Dan. Hi, Dan. Don't worry, I'm going to be in for a while yet. So. Okay. Come on, man. Hi, Dan. World-class imports is directly opposite Derek's company. But that night, it was about 20 past six, and... We've been staying behind simply because we were waiting for our driver to turn up. He'd gone to do the delivery down in South End. 
I was looking up and down outside the windows from the showroom. I noticed there was a dark blue or a black car pull over and it slowed right down outside our window and I thought, well, I hope that's not a late customer. I carried on looking to see where this car had got to. A couple of minutes later, I noticed it was coming back again and uh, it did come up there twice. So it was about 20 to 7 I actually got in my car and got to the end of the road and as I got round to the corner, I realised that same car was there and it looked as if it was stationary. And, and I was, like, ready to overtake it. As I did so, the car suddenly just, like, slowly pulled away from me, so I was behind it. Unfortunately, he didn't notice the registration number. But the car crossed Canning Town flyover, heading towards Essex. <laughs> he got another one after that. <laughs> While they were there, the cleaners remember Derek received two phone calls. <laughs> At about 6.35, they heard him laughing and joking on the phone. Then, just five minutes later, the phone rang again. This time, the conversation was longer and more serious. The cleaners left the offices at about 10 to 7. Good night, Good night Derek. Good night. Derek was now the only person in the building. Concerned that Derek hadn't made the usual goodnight phone call to his son, Mrs Johnson tried a number of times to contact him. By about 20 to midnight, extremely worried by now, she decided to drive the 10 miles to his office. Derek had been killed shortly after the cleaners left, between 7 o'clock and half past 7. Dave Easy, the intention was burglary, but do you think whoever did this intended to kill Derek Johnson? Mr Johnson had been tied with rope, his hands and his feet, and sellotape had been wrapped very firmly around his nose and mouth. He couldn't possibly breathe. Whoever did it knew that he would suffocate. Now you brought with you a piece of the rope that was used to tie Derek up. What is particular about this piece of rope? Well, as you can see, this is sash cord rope and it isn't manufactured in this country. The rope in length that was used to tie up Derek Johnson was 24 feet, and the ends of both pieces were sealed, as you can see at the end, with a burn. I need to know if anybody sold a rope of that length, sealed like that, and any date near the 6th of November. Let's move on to those two phone conversations. They're both quite short conversations, overheard by the office cleaners. What might their significance be? There were two calls at 6.38 and 6.40 p.m. They were the last calls that Mr Johnson would have received. It's important for us to know who made those calls. Even if it's only to eliminate them from inquiries? That's correct. So if you haven't come forward, please do, do come forward and, and tell us that you were those people. There are some specific people that you now know about who you want to trace who were seen in that area on that evening. That's right. In particular, the op occupants of two motor vehicles. The first motor vehicle is a dark car which parked at the entrance to Leapfield Maritime at 6.48 p.m. There were two occupants, both male. The passenger got out of the vehicle and walked towards Leap time, Leapfield Maritime. The vehicle then drove off after about 10 minutes without this passenger. Some 15 minutes after this, he was seen running away from Leapfield Maritime towards Canning Town flyover. The second vehicle is a Ford vehicle. At about 7.20 p.m. it parked again at the entrance to Leapfield Maritime with two male occupants. After about two minutes, the driver and the passenger got out and changed places. After about five minutes, they also drove off towards Canning Town flyover. I need, need to know who those men are, in particular who was the running man. And somebody may have seen them or the running man and I need them to contact us. Right, these are absolutely vital. Remember, we're talking about Tuesday the 6th of November, early evening, between 6.30 and 7.30. There are local people who have got together to offer a reward of £10,000. If you know anything at all, this is the number to ring, please, if you can help at all. The smallest detail might make all the difference. 081 811 8181 here in the studio, or you can ring the North Woolwich Police Station direct on 0708 729 602. That's 0708 729 602.
Now to this month's incident desk, here to take us through it, Superintendent David Hatcher and Detective Constable Jackie Hames. Good evening. First, colleagues in Merseyside need your help to solve the brutal rape of a 14-year-old schoolgirl. If you recognise this man, please read now. We think he'd been indecently exposing himself to young girls and women throughout the evening of Sunday the 20th of January in and around the Rain Hill area of Merseyside. At nine o'clock in Chatsworth Road, he exposed himself to three 14-year-old girls and started to follow one of them along the main A57 Warrington Road. At Whiston Hospital Nurses' Home, he attacked and raped her. He did, however, leave a clue behind, this emerald green T-shirt. We know it was bought from Freeman's Summer 89 catalogue. He's 25 to 30, 5 foot 9 to 6 feet tall, very skinny and looks scruffy. If you think you recognise him or the T-shirt, please call us now. Police Constable Mark Thorpe will never forget the early hours of Monday the 28th of January. He and a colleague answered a routine call to investigate a burglar alarm going off at Gateway Supermarket in Bristol. There they disturbed two men robbing the cigarette kiosk near the entrance. Mark Thorpe was stabbed repeatedly by the man he tackled. The descriptions of the robbers are vague because they wore balaclavas. We only know they were well built One's five foot six and the other's six feet tall. Their getaway car is a better clue. It was stolen almost a week before on January the 22nd from Oxford. It's a red Toyota Supra with false plates. Registration number E351UBW. It was found on fire three miles away from the robbery in the St George's area of Bristol. Perhaps you saw it parked somewhere between January the 22nd and the 28th. And it had done 640 miles that week but it's only 70 miles from Oxford to Bristol, so where had it been? If you can help on this, please do ring. PC Thorpe and his colleagues would be very grateful. And there is a very substantial reward on offer. If you know this woman, you could find, help us find her murderer. On Sunday, February the 3rd, her body was found in south-east London. She'd been battered to death. My colleagues are searching for clues to her identity. They know she's about 30 with blue-grey eyes. She's five feet tall and wore size 10 clothes. This is how she was dressed on the night she died. And these are her real clothes. She was seen on a ferry from France and said she was returning from visiting her ex-husband in Paris. She herself was English. Why was she in the New Cross area of London on Saturday night, the 2nd of February? She was seen on a number 141 bus at 11.30 p.m., only six hours before her body was found in nearby Telegraph Hill Park. If you do know this lady, please ring us tonight. Someone, family or friend, must be missing her by now. Some London burglars have left an unusual clue behind, one of their friend's voices on tape. On Thursday, December the 13th, a house was robbed in Maida Vale, London, by three men but they got a woman to ring up and check that only the German au pair would be in when they called on the pretense of delivering some flowers. See if you recognise her voice while we show you some of the things she st the gang stole. This is into Flora. We've got a basket of flowers to be delivered. Can you tell me what time she'll be returning? Um, I don't know, but I, I'm here till 3 o'clock, so... She won't be returning before then? Uh, sorry? What time will she be returning? I don't know, I have to think about four o'clock. OK, but you're there till three. You can yeah. Them. OK, thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. The thieves were in their thirties and had London accents. We think they used a white BMW 5 Series for their getaway. If you know who they are or recognise the woman's voice, please ring. And now a case which made national news headlines, the murder of Hertfordshire accountant Patrick Hurling. He was strangled in the early hours of Saturday, December the 1st, at his home in Hartford, and fires were started in the house and garage. A number of his personal belongings are missing, and my Hertfordshire colleagues are hoping they will lead him to his killer. First, there's his 18-karat gold wedding ring, the pair to this one. It's unusual and has three bands with a brick design. The outer bands are yellow gold, and the inner one, white gold. We think it's engraved with TC7315 or with a consecutive number. Also missing is his black leather wallet like this one with Bridgman Golf Society 1989-90 in gold lettering and Mr Helling's credit cards are also missing. But the most distinctive of all is his identity bracelet. We've had a copy made up. It's set with diamonds spelling his name. There's a large reward for information leading to convictions in this case, so if you recognise any of these things or you think you can help in any way, please call us. 
Many of our appeals to you for help involve odd circumstances, but this one is particularly strange. A body was dumped here on some wasteland six weeks ago. The area is Allerton Park near Leeds, and it's a relatively isolated part of the city. What's strange is the condition of the body. Scientists tell us that it's of a man who died at least a year ago, but he could have been dead for up to five years. He's never been properly buried, and nobody knows who he is. Perhaps you'll recognise him from this model of his face, reconstructed from his skull. He was white, probably in his 20s, 5 foot 2 to 5 foot 6, with an average build, and light brown or ginger hair. Or you might remember his ear stud, watch, or the jumper that he was wearing, like this one. My Leeds colleagues need any help you can give them on this, so if you do recognise him, please ring. And finally, I'd like to give a word of warning to anyone trying to sell their car through a local paper. If you get a call from someone guaranteeing to sell it for you in 72 hours, be extremely suspicious. Last July, two men started up a company called Bedford Cars to do just that. Nine quality cars worth more than £80,000 have subsequently disappeared. Don't add your name to the list of frustrated ex-donors. There are two men to look out for. Kenneth Ward is 30, 5 foot 10 and of slim build. He has a large tattoo on his right forearm with the word Yorkshire written under a picture of a rose. He also calls himself Roger Phillips and Robert Brown. His partner calls himself William Day and he is described as 30 to 40, 6 foot, stocky build with possibly a Scottish accent. These two men only stayed in Bedford for two weeks so they could be in your area now. So if you're thinking of letting them sell your car, Please don't. Ring us instead on this or any of our other incident desk cases. And this is the number if you can help. 081 811 8181. That's 081 811 8181. We're getting a large volume of calls tonight uh, on the Cowley robbery. About 25 people so far have told us that the tracksuit we showed up, the logo on it means guaranteed made in Ireland. Uh, Met a Metropolitan Police officer has re reported seeing the blue Vauxhall Cavalier, at least one with a broken window not long ago, and uh, two men attempted to trade in such a car not all that far from where the crime took place. Uh, on the uh, photo call, we've got two prison officers who've given the same name for one case. Uh, and indeed, the police are going to that uh, straight away. And two viewers have given the name for, uh, I won't say who it is now, uh, somebody else in photo call. And again, police are investigating right now. Our next case is one of those crimes that's as frightening as an Alfred Hitchcock film. The murder of a young woman in the dark just a few yards from her home. The depiction of this sort of crime in fiction gives the impression it's quite common and makes many women scared. In fact, this sort of offence is rare, but tends to make big headlines. You won't find our reconstruction frightening, only rather sad. But maybe it will induce people to call us with information. Geraldine Polk lived with her mum and dad in Cardiff. A few days before Christmas, approaching her own doorstep, she was stabbed repeatedly, raped and dumped in a nearby stream. Her family and friends, together with several witnesses, have taken part in this reconstruction of the last hours of her life. It's the night of Friday the 21st of December, the Friday before Christmas, and Cardiff city centre was crowded with partygoers. Like so many others that night, Geraldine was on an office outing with some colleagues from Celtic Shipping, where she'd worked for the past two years. They arrived at the Bank Wine Bar at about 10 to 6. As I say, speak to anyone. She she lived life. She lived it to the, the fullest. Very, very outgoing. And that was Geraldine, a very loving girl towards her family. 
a niece and nephew, you know, mum and dad and myself, very, very close. She was a bridesmaid in her favourite colour, which was what I wanted, because it suited her red. I mean, that was her favourite colour, and that's why I chose those colours for my wedding. She would have lived to have she made got a married. Yeah. She would have made a good mother. At about 11.40, Geraldine and a couple of her friends arrived at Jackson's nightclub in Westgate Street. Geraldine never returned. But then, at about 20 past midnight, she joined a taxi queue just across the street from Jackson's nightclub, outside Castle Cabs. Hiya, Jess. Oh, hiya. Where have you been? Oh, uh, the bank, wine press, and then Jackson's. Who have you been with? Oh, some of my mates from work. On your own? Yeah, I'm knackered. I've been out all day. I'm going home. Yeah, me too. Here's my taxi. I'll see you then. Yeah, bye then. Have a nice Christmas. Yeah, I do. By 12.45, Geraldine had got a cab herself and was sharing it towards Fairwater. She asked to be dropped off about 250 yards from her house perhaps to save the taxi having to turn round in the estate. Merry Christmas. Either she walked along Waterhall Road or took a shortcut across school playing fields. But just 20 yards from her door... Stop! I was driving down Waterhall Road at about ten past one in the morning and I was taking my babysitter home. As I approached Bracken Place, I saw, I thought, what was a lover's tiff? He just had his hands on her shoulders and was shaking her. And as I carried on down Waterhall Road, there was a girl and two boys walking down past the school. They were only 20 or 30 yards away from the argument when I saw them. The three people must have walked past the couple that were arguing just seconds before I drove past them. A few minutes later, screams were heard by people in nearby houses. And about half an hour later, in the same area, a couple saw a man running from the direction of the school playing fields, where Geraldine's body was found next day. The man flagged down a taxi, which turned round a little further on in Bracken Place and came back to pick him up. They drove off towards Cardiff city centre. I had a feeling then there was something wrong because Geraldine hadn't come home from the night before and it wasn't like her not to telephone or whatever to tell us. Uh, and then uh, I had to go down to Cardiff Royal Infirmary to actually identify her. Um, my parents just can't speak to anyone. They're absolutely devastated. Um, they just can't believe that something has happened like this uh, to Geraldine. And uh, we're convinced that there's someone out there, somewhere, knows something about this. And if they're keeping it to themselves, well, that'll be on their conscience for as long as they live. But that's all they need to do is pick the phone up, for me or the police. It's only the information we're after. We're not after their names or addresses. Just help us to catch this person. Just a note of detail, there was snow there, as you saw. It was snowing dur during our reconstruction. It was not snowing on the Friday night before Christmas. Phil Jones, this attack was one of enormous ferocity. Yes, it was. It was a brutal and sustained attack on a decent young woman who had got within yards of her home before being bundled into the middle of a playing fields opposite the home, raped, repeatedly beat about the head, and stabbed over 80 occasions, on over 80 occasions, before being dragged about 130 yards to a brook uh, near the Fairwater Leisure Centre. What it means is that whoever did it would have been absolutely covered in blood. Yes, he would have been. Very substantially bloodstained um, and muck about his clothing and his footwear. So someone went home on early in the morning of that Saturday before Christmas with a lot of blood and muck on them? Yes, he did. 
three witnesses we saw in Waterhole Road. Obviously, you want those to come forward. That was late that Friday night, early this Saturday morning, who were walking past the arguing couple. Anyone else you want to find? Yes, we've already spoken to a lot of people in that area at that time, but we'd appeal for anyone else who was out in that area after 12.30 to come forward. Anyone else you want to find? Yes, we do. Um, I am firmly of the opinion that Geraldine had formed an association with a man during the 10 days um, or had an association with a man during the 10 days leading up to her death. Uh, she didn't confide in anyone about it. I've already appealed for that man to come forward uh, to date without success. I'm, I'll appeal again and I'll ask anyone who may have any idea about uh, his identity to come and speak to us. Now that friend or indeed other men you're appealing or other witnesses you're appealing for who were leaving the area late that night might have legitimate reasons for not wanting to come forward, at least non-criminal ones. They might have been with someone they shouldn't have been with. Are you going to reveal anything about their private life to the public? What I'd say is this, I'm in the business of trying to detect a murder, nothing else. So if they come, you'll treat any information they give you with absolute discretion? Yes. You found a key. It might not have been Geraldine's, but it, it might have been. Describe the key to us, can you? Well, it wasn't Geraldine's. The, the key was found about 20 yards from the site of an attack upon her. Um, it's a duplicate key cut from a blank with the, the word Ilko uh, embossed on it. It's come from a lock uh, which has been fitted to a double glazed aluminium door, probably fitted to a shop or commercial premises or even to a house. Uh, it could have been on a bottom or fitted to a bottom rail a lock on a shutter door or even a padlock. Okay, well, if you know who lost that key, or indeed if you lost it, or think you did, please call us. Here's the number if you can help in any way, 81 or you can call the CID in Cardiff. They're on 0222 398 381. That's 0222, the code for Cardiff, 398 381. Well, more calls are still coming in behind us. On our reconstruction of Derek Johnson's murder, we've had calls with suggestions on where the rope might have come from and what it might have been designed for. Um, on photo call, in fact, officers are on their way to investigate three particular photo call cases at the moment. And, uh, yeah, at the moment, that's all we can say. Uh, as far as Internet Desk is concerned, there also has been some names to the video fit on the case of the rape inquiry in Rainhill in the Merseyside area. I hope there'll be more to tell you when we come back on air at 25 past 11, immediately after question time. That'll be Crime Watch update in about an hour from now. Meanwhile, the lines in the studio here will be staying open until midnight, and the local numbers for the investigations are on page 618 of CFAX. And if you can't stay up till then, we'll bring you up to date next month on how these crimes are being solved. Whatever happens, don't have nightmares, please. Sleep well. Good night. Good night. Welcome back. At this moment, I'm pleased to say police officers are en route to particular locations in various parts of the country, following up leads which have been provided tonight by Crime Watch viewers. But I must say a disappointing response so far on the murder of Geraldine Polk near her home in Cardiff. Someone knows who committed that crime. Our lines are still open, they will be till midnight, and detectives are still hoping for that one crucial call. Let's look first at the robbery outside Unipart in Cowley in Oxford. Two gunmen tried to raid a security van, but they were foiled when other drivers and nearby workers intervened. Come on, let's get it!
Uh, Dave Buckingham, you had a really good response on this one. Oh, yes, we had an excellent response. We've had over 200 calls now. What about identities? What about names? We had a video fit for, for one of the robbers. Yes, good video fit. A uh, man, 30, 35 years, uh, six foot tall, short, dark hair, and we've had a good response and some names put forward. And the tracksuit, uh, I know that uh, you've now discovered all about the tracksuit and the logo on it. Yes, it's guaranteed Irish and definitely from Ireland. And we know that it was bought there because there was a receipt in the pocket, so there's obviously an Irish connection to this somehow. The Vauxhall Cavalier, dark blue car that was uh, used by the robbers, has that turned up? Remember one of the windows, of course, was smashed. Yes, a lot of good information about that. Um, we're following up leads straight away. Very what, good. What about the number plate? You wanted to know where that had come from, the false plate made up by somebody? Yes, and also another good response. Um, people have rung in and we're following that up as quickly as possible. The gun that was used turned out to be a, a, a Brunei replica of a, of a Beretta automatic. Now, you don't know where that came from, you've recovered the weapon. Had anybody reported it stolen or missing? Yes, we've had a couple of people ring in and say they've had that type of weapon stolen. Um, quite close to Oxford as well. So, another, another good lead, we'll follow that up as quickly as we can. All in all, a very encouraging response. Very encouraging indeed. Good, Sue. Well, now let's see if anybody's been recognised from our photo call cases. David, first of all, there was Farzad Baboud, who was wanted in connection with a rape inquiry. Yes, sir. We've had 20 calls, in fact, over 20 calls now on that, and I heard others just coming in. A number of them give us positive sightings in the Harrogate and Leeds area, so that looks very optimistic. We discovered in the main programme that there have been some names for the off-licence robber in Merseyside. Yes, we've had 10 calls on that one. We're now pretty sure we know who he is, we just don't know where he is. So if you know where he is now, please still call in. We need to know urgently. You can't Will say too much on that for obvious reasons. Right. What about William Dolman? Yes, he's... We've had ten calls on that. It's brought a multitude of sightings, well spaced around the country, so that's a little vague at this time. Again, if you know where he is, call us. We'd also had a few calls on the fraudster in Merseyside, 120 frauds or more he'd committed. Yes, indeed, and three of those Allegedly. have given us the same name, uh, and one of them is from a very reliable source, so we're very optimistic there. We've just got to locate him again. David, thank you. Well, now the tragedy of Geraldine Polk, a young woman on her way home from a nightclub who was murdered in sight of her own doorstep. Merry Christmas. Yeah, Merry Christmas then. Phil Jones, as Sue said at the beginning, a very disappointing response. Yes, it has been. Uh, we've had a number of calls uh, uh, giving us some ideas about the key and about the rugby jersey. But insofar as uh, her movements out of Jackson's or her movements after leaving the taxi uh, that night this concerning Fairwater, nothing. Now, tell us about the key. This key, I mean, for anybody who didn't see the original programme has now come in, a key was discovered near where she was attacked. Yes, it was discovered or uh, found 20 yards from the first site of the uh, scene of the attack on Geraldine. It's uh, a duplicate key cut from a blank, uh, embossed with the word ILCO, I-L-C-O. Um, it will fit a lock, which itself is probably fitted to an aluminium double-glazed door, probably a commercial door as opposed to a house, but we wouldn't rule a house out. Uh, or the bottom rail of a roller shutters, or even a padlock. OK, above all, you need to hear from anybody who uh, knew Geraldine, particularly who, who had met her recently, and you need to find three people who were walking nearby where she was killed. But yes. no calls from them so far. That was, uh, of course, on the Friday night before Christmas in uh, Waterhill Road in Cardiff. Sue. So. Well, now the murder of Derek Johnson at his office in East London. Derek had built up a thriving import and export business and he was working late, as he often did. The office cleaners remember that Derek took two telephone calls that evening. The first one seemed friendly and very short, the second a little bit longer and much more serious. And Dave Easy's been taking the calls, both here and in the incident room, and I gather the incident room in Woolwich has been inundated with calls. Yes, we've had an excellent result with the, with the rope in particular, and a lot of the phone calls have certainly helped us out. We've also had some phone calls regarding the motor cars, which is also encouraging. And I'd also like to just very quickly ask for the person that called regarding the address in Cannon Town. That is a very important address, and I would like that person to call us back. He do they don't have to give their name or address but just speak to us, please. Right, so there are some details you need to check, and just to repeat, you don't have to give your name and address. Please do call back again. Mr Easy, thank you very much. Well, now, incident desk, here's uh, Jackie Hames. Let's start with that rape in, in Rainhill. 
yes. quite a lot of calls on it, I think. Yeah, over 60. The, in fact, the incident room was inundated. The majority of them were su suggesting names. There's one person I would like to appeal to to ring again. They rang the incident room in Prescott and apparently saw the man and the victim that night together at a bus stop. Please ring back. You are a vital witness and we would very much like to speak to you again. Of course, your call will be treated in absolute confidence, so please, if you're watching, ring again. Anything else on that case? Well, there was a lot, number of the calls were suggesting names. Um, one in particular was a local man, so we're hopeful on that too. Now, the, the body that, that was discovered in Leeds, which was mummified, I mean, it looks as though it had died between one, two, three years ago. Yeah. Um, dumped six weeks ago in Allerton Park, Leeds, a dozen calls all giving different names. Let's have another look at him. Remember, he's in his 20s, and if you do know him, please ring us. And a woman's body that was dumped in a park in south-east London. Yeah, uh, we've had 16 calls, unfortunately no names yet. Um, this was Sunday the 3rd of February. She was dumped in Telegraph Hill Park in uh, south-east London. Please, if you know her or have any idea who she is, please ring us. About 30 years old, quite short, about five feet tall. Yeah. They've been on a cross-channel ferry recently, we think. That's right. A burglary in Maida Vale, where people had rung up first and said they were from Interfloor, about to deliver some flowers to see if anyone was in. That's right, yes. This is on the 13th of December. We had 12 calls, nothing very encouraging. Have another listen to the tape. And this see is if Interfloor. You We've got a basket of flowers to be delivered. Can you tell me what time should be returning? Um, I don't know, but I, I'm here till 3 o'clock, so... She won't be returning before then? Uh, sorry? What time will she be returning? I don't know, I think about 4 o'clock. OK, but you're there till 3. You can yeah. Them. OK, thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Then there was the stabbing of the police constable in Bristol. Mm. Yes, this is the 28th of January at the Gateway Supermarket in Bristol. Uh, we've had nearly 30 calls, mainly about the red Toyota Supra car that was stolen in Oxford. Um, the two men were wearing balaclavas, but if anybody has any information, please ring. It's something we didn't mention before, in fact, there's a £20,000 reward lead, uh, payable on the arrest and conviction of any of these two men, so please ring up. Then there are a couple of men who were wanted in connection with what seems to have been a fraud, which is uh, answering ads in local papers for cars for sale, saying, we'll sell your car in 72 hours, and yep. the cars disappeared. Yep. Well, over 30 calls, um, and I have to say that we've already had an arrest on this case, which is great news. Unfortunately, I can't give you too many details, but next month we'll hear all about it, I'm sure. Jackie, thanks very much. Sue? And on that note, that's it for now. Thank you if you've called to help. If you haven't got through yet, our lines are going to be open until midnight, so that's another 25 minutes. And all the local numbers will be shown on your screen in just a minute. And we'll be back, uh, as usual, a month from now. Until then, don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night.